This is hockey prime time. As you may have noticed, I am not Connor McKenna. My name is Michelle Strino. Welcome to the program. I'm filling in for Mr. McKenna as he has had a once in a lifetime opportunity flash itself and appear before him as we speak. He's probably tailgating at Minimaid Park, the only guy I know to probably tailgate in front of a baseball game for game four of the World Series between the Astros and the Dodgers. And hey, I would have taken that opportunity too. So instead, over the next two hours, you get to listen to myself along with Laura Saba and this fine lineup of guests right here on Hockey Prime Time. And before I get into this jam packed two hours that we have coming at you today, I'll let you know how and where you can communicate with us through social media at Hockey Prime Time. At Michelle Storino is how you can contact myself through Twitter. On Facebook, facebook.com slash Hockey Primetime. And past episodes can be found on HockeyPrimetime.com and on iTunes. So you're probably wondering, all right, Michelle, you're new. I've never heard you on the show before. Tell me, what do we have on tap so far as we enter now the fourth Saturday of the NHL season. Well, we've got John Rosen, who is the LA Kings insider, joining us in about 15 minutes or so. Those LA Kings, we talk about surprises in the NHL. The Kings, for me, are right up there. They have to be on the same plane as the Vegas Golden Knights and the New Jersey Devils. To me, those one, two, and three are probably just as surprising as anything that I've seen so far and obviously Vegas getting a a lot of the publicity so far as they should, because not only have they just annihilated every record in terms of an inaugural season, but they also had a phenomenal homestand that who cares if you're in your first season or in your 100th season going six and one, during a seven game homestand is pretty damn good. Anyways, we're going to talk, we're going to talk to John Rosen, who is the LA King insider a little bit later on about those LA Kings, Brian Burns, who is a reporter at Tampa Bay lightning.com. We'll talk to him about the lightning and they're not surprising to me because this is what was supposed to happen last season when I called them to win at least the Eastern conference. And then of course, uh, all the, the train got off the track, so to speak, because of all the injuries. So we'll talk to him as well. And then in the second hour, we have guest after guest after guest, starting with Christopher Martell, who covers the Preds for Fox Sports Tennessee. And he co-hosts the Neutral Zone on 104.5 The Zone. So those Nashville Predators coming off a big Central Division victory over the Chicago Blackhawks back in action again Saturday. We'll talk about them. Joe Yurden from NHL.com. He covers the Buffalo Sabres. And that's a team that really, they're one of those teams to me that should be a little bit better. And you're probably thinking, yeah, but it's the Sabres. It doesn't matter. They still have a decent enough lineup to be putting together or stringing together some wins. And there's a lot of frustration going on. And when you have a Hall of Famer and Phil Housley being your brand new coach, I know there's so much adjustment going on. And I think that's really what we're seeing. And I'm hoping this adjustment period kind of slows down a little bit for them and kind of uh, tails off and they can get to playing a little bit more consistent hockey and the hockey that I think that they're capable of playing anyways. So we'll talk to Joe Yearden and then uh, we'll wrap up the show with uh, Isabel Kershudian who covers the Capitals for the Washington Post. Another team to me that's kind of like, I am not 100% sure who the Washington Capitals are because they surprised me coming out of the gate and scoring as many goals as they have, and then they get shellacked by the Vancouver Canucks of all teams, and they're on this, you know, Western Canadian road trip, which is always really tough for a lot of 
a lot of hockey teams. So we'll see how they do as they enter Edmonton, kind of hostile territory as well as they are looking to kind of find their footing and find their offense as well. So now that all the pleasantries are kind of out of the way, it's a great time to bring in the producer of this fantastic show, Laura Saba. Laura, female infusion day here on Hockey Prime Time. So there are 12 games. Sorry. Yeah, come on in here. I just wanted to say, hey, Michelle, it's really great to be part of it. I know. I love it. I don't think we were talking kind of off air. Pretty sure we've never had, at least here on NHL Network Radio, Series XM 91, any kind of uh, female host and then a co-host. So we're breaking boundaries. I love it. <laughs> I'm so excited to be here right now and I'm yeah. really excited for the next couple hours. Yes, exactly. We're, it's like I said, it's going to be a real fun show. 12 games around the NHL and there are a few intriguing matchups. To me, I see kind of the emotional part of Matt Cullen facing the Penguins for the first time since signing uh, with his uh, home province or excuse me, home state, uh, Minnesota Wild. So there's that one. But then, of course, there's the Rangers heading into the Bell Center um, as the Habs are off to their worst start in 76 years. And, you know, you being in Montreal, I mean, everyone always says Toronto is kind of the Leafs are Canada's team kind of thing. But I don't think so. I think Montreal kind of takes that moniker because of just the pandemonium, I guess you could say. And I ha I, I must admit, there's got to be some craziness going on right now in Montreal to the point where Mark Bergeron had to have a State of a Union address on Wednesday to talk about just calm down and relax, folks. <laughs> We're only an eighth through the season. Just give us a little bit of perspective on, on how you know, everyone sees this entire situation, which obviously isn't a good one in Montreal anyway. Right. And and I mean, we're talking about the Toronto and Montreal comparison. Like I would say the Leafs uh, definitely have a huge following. Um, but in Montreal, it's a little bit more intense in terms of the entire city. If the Habs are doing well, the entire city is in a good mood. And then if the Habs are doing badly, the entire city is just depressed. And um, and it gets to a point where you put enough losses in a row or enough losses in a short time span where things go start going off the rails in terms of what fans are talking about, what the media is talking about. Mark Bergevin in general doesn't usually take requests to meet with the media unless something's going on. Um, and he usually declines them. And so he declined it earlier this week as just a matter of course, like he doesn't usually do it, but in a situation where you're losing so many games, you can't really afford to do that. So then the next day he did agree to meet with the media or he scheduled, um, he scheduled a press conference and um, that in itself became a story. If, if this was a regular season where the Habs were, weren't losing so much, so badly, so historically, I think that that wouldn't even have been a blip on the radar. You know, he didn't feel like meeting with them because normally what happens is when the GM of a team wants to meet with the media, people think, okay, either a trade's coming, somebody's injured, there's some bad news, there's some good news. But this, you know, it was, it was one of those things where there wasn't really that much to talk about, but he had to he had to face face the music, so to speak, because things were just going off the rails and he had to, you know, he had to tell everybody to chill out and he had to defend his players. And, and this is one of those things where this record is an anomaly. We've talked about how bad it is and it's, you know, their shooting percentage is at, at, at a, like an unbelievably low percentage and they're, you know, the number one goaltender in the world is having a very bad start to the season. And these are all things that are bad luck and bad timing, and they're all happening at the same time. So it is kind of an anomalous situation. And obviously in Montreal, where we live and die by the Habs, it has been a crazy week, couple of weeks, I would say. My God, my goodness. And it's even more interesting because they're facing against a Rangers team that to me is very similar, you know, off to not the greatest of starts either. You know, they're uh, only ahead of them by three points in the standings, even though they've played one more game. Um, and it's, they kind of mirror each other in terms of, all right, you have a few really good pieces on offense up front, guys that can put the puck in the back of the net. You know, for both teams, you want to believe in Galchenyuk. You know, Duran and Pacioretty have done so before uh, in the past. So you do have these great pieces. In New York, you know, you have Matt Zuccarello. Uh, you've seen Rick Nash and what he can do. You could see uh, Chris Kreider as he had a, you know, the a career year last year and what he could 
could do. And then you have these two, you know, two of the best goalies in the entire planet in Hank and Kerry. And both of these guys have looked very upset and emotional. And we know that Henrik Lundqvist is that emotional guy. Carey Price isn't. And he looks so frustrated to start the season. And that's the thing I think that intrigues me the most about this entire situation uh, surrounding the Montreal Canadiens is that we're seeing Carey Price be very uncharacteristic. And that should kind of tell you something too. You know what I mean? Like this body language, everything that he's doing really is, you know, kind of part and parcel into this entire situation. And that's why this game against the Rangers, it's a statement game for both of these teams. Which direction are we going to head in? And what makes this kind of an even juicier tale is that Andre Pavlik is starting in net for the second consecutive game. And to me, that's kind of a head scratcher why that's even happening. Um, you know, knowing that this is the perfect opportunity for them to go into Montreal, a team that's obviously, you know, in a downward spiral. And if you have Hank and Nett, you kind of want to say that it's almost, I don't want to say a guaranteed win because nothing's guaranteed, but you obviously have a better chance at winning. Right. Especially against this particular iteration of the Canadians. Um, yes. Henrik Lundqvist has had demons at the Bell Center. He did extinguish them or, um, you know, exercise them last year. But he did, uh, he, he has had some really bad, unfortunate games in the Bell Center itself. Um, and so that it could be a mental thing. But then when, like, when you're looking at it from the outside, you're trying to figure out what Alain Vigneault is thinking. Is it, is he trying to shield Henrik Lundqvist from that in order to not demoralize him further? Or is he... You know, is he trying to give his team confidence? You know, when when you when you pull the goalie, this is kind of like a preemptive pulling the goalie. Um, and so it, it is a little bit of a head scratcher, like you said. And Henrik Lundqvist in general doesn't have a terrible um, record against the Habs. It's just when he's playing at the Bell Center for some reason. Uh, I think last year he beat the Habs at the Bell Center. It was the first time in something like six games, or you know, it, it, he he really does struggle there. And and I want and and it's not an easy arena to play in for visiting goalies and and they have complained about it um the most famous example would be tim thomas saying that he couldn't even hear his his own defenseman uh because the habs are so the habs fans are so loud and stuff like that so um it is i don't feel sorry for them <laughs> i don't feel sorry for them by the way with that that just means you got a good crowd on your hands exactly that's all that means to me right and and so and and so that's that's why it is a bit of a head scratcher and andre pavlik um you know, that was kind of, uh, it, it was a weird signing to me because I thought after his record in, in Winnipeg, you know, this would have been a, like, he, he would not have had a place in the NHL, um, but we've seen, um, and we can talk about this a little bit later, I, I feel like we're running out of time, but like we've seen the goalie market just, um, you know, everybody's on waivers, everybody's being traded, every, yeah. you know, it's, it's just kind of a little bit crazy, but it is definitely tonight in Montreal, it is going to be a story about goaltending. We just don't know what story it is yet. Well, and, you know, upon further reading as well, Pavlik is actually 2-0-0 and has a 1.92 goals against average and a 942 save percentage in his past three games against Montreal. So you're right. It is a point of AV kind of shielding Hank from the Bell Center, but at the same time, maybe rewarding his uh, backup because he's had these good numbers against Montreal in his most recent starts. So uh, he's trying to go with the numbers game, you know, almost uh, like a baseball kind of a deal. But <laughs> sometimes I think in hockey, I mean, this is such a fluid game that those things, they do mean something, but then again, they don't really at the end of the day. Like you said, Hank eventually got over it. He's a good enough goaltender. He's world-class. He's going to get over that kind of a thing too, right? So Exactly. Um, so that's already... In the books, holy geez, that went by fast. <laughs> uh, we'll get back to the Hab story too because uh, I also find it very ironic and kind of entertaining the fact that this is the worst start in 76 years and everything always comes back to P.K. Subban. <laughs> oh, I definitely want to talk about that more later. <laughs> oh, man. It just, it, you, you can't help but laugh at stuff like that, right? <laughs> you can't help but just uh, kind of smirk to yourself. Well, we've got so much coming up on the show. Coming up after the break... We're going to talk about one of the biggest surprises in the NHL and those LA Kings. John Rosen, the LA Kings insider, is with us as Hockey Primetime continues right here on Sirius XM NHL Network Radio and streaming live on HockeyPrimetime.com and all of our social media pages powered by Primetime Radio. <laughs>
goes puck left side. Brown, a centering pass, tip, score! Andre Kopitar with 2.14 left in regulation. Brown to Kopitar. Welcome back to Hockey Primetime. Michelle Strino filling in for Connor McKenna. You just heard the captain of the LA Kings. He's already got seven goals this season, over half of what he accumulated all of last year. As the LA Kings are one of the biggest surprises in the NHL so far through the first three and a half weeks of the season. And joining us on the line to talk a little bit about them is the LA Kings insider, John Rosen. John, thank you so much for joining us today here on Hockey Primetime. Michelle, my pleasure. Thank you so much. So I've been one of those people that was kind of going through his game-by-game stats, and he scored his sixth goal last year, I think, in game 45, and he did it just two weeks in, two and a half weeks in of this season. What did Ange do in Slovenia in the off season to make him completely change everything that happened uh, compared to the 2016-2017 campaign? Well, he's a little bit, uh, a little bit thinner and slimmer, and you can see that on the ice. But I don't think that's as big of a deal as is what he hasn't done. He didn't have to go through Olympic qualifying uh, as he did last year, even before the World Cup of Hockey. Uh, he did not have to. Uh, he did not get injured in the twentieth game of the season as he did last year, uh, early on in the year. It's something that affected him early on in the first half of the year. Um, but when you look at Andre Kopitar and you look at Dustin Brown, a lot of their success can be traced both to a little bit of the uh, new environment uh, with a new coaching staff and a group that uh, the success is snowballed. They're having fun. They're winning, uh, but also some uh, loose and purse strings in the offensive zone. Uh, he's had success driving to the front of the net. His shot rate hasn't really varied much. He's hitting the net more. Uh, keep in mind last year, he hit the, he hit goalposts uh, with a frequency greater than any other King last. Year. So he probably could have been credited with a couple of more goals, um, but it's a, just a little bit more uh, less restrictive in the offensive zone. Uh, than, than in previous years, and, and you know, all this underlying stuff, you, I don't want to take away from what Daryl Sutter had done with the Los Angeles Kings and leading them to two Stanley Cups uh, and really continuing to instill the defensive identity that this team had, uh, especially been building up uh, after and during uh, Terry Murray's tenure as well. Um, but uh, there are less restrictions in the offensive zone. He's able to get the puck on net, uh, and both he and uh, Dustin Brown uh, have been having success. They've been playing together, and, and also with line mate Alex Iafalo, who's been digging pucks free and finding his line mates. Uh, it's been a really good story. The Kings' top players early on in this year uh, have made a huge impact for this team. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that's something, too, that's even more to me surprising the fact that they've adjusted so quickly to the change. And I guess maybe because it is the chains off kind of a deal that guys are being let loose a little bit more. And the fact that maybe John Stevens was technically there, but not in this kind of capacity, does that make the transition easier as well? Yes, absolutely. Um, that there is the familiarity. Uh, there was no uh, sort of uh, breaking through process or anything like that that would be difficult for them or, or any new, new coach coming in. Uh, I still think that there's another level that this team can reach defensively. Uh, this team is giving up a little bit too much right now uh, at even strength. Jonathan Quick has been a rock. I mean, we could throw out all the narratives we want, but you look at Jonathan Quick right now, he's got a 944 save percentage on the season. When you look at the scoring chances, a little bit inflated from what we've seen in recent years. The Kings still are giving up the fewest goals per game in the league, but that's just because Jonathan Quick has been so good. Uh, L.A., like Boston, the team that they're playing tonight, their star players are also their top defensive players, and the Kings have had that success with guys like Brown and Kopitar, uh, you know, and then the second line now with Adrian Kempe centering uh, Tanner Pearson and Tyler Toffoli. But there are a lot of chances coming against uh, the third and fourth line. If the Kings can iron that out and get back to, again, four lines rolling – and finding that hard checking success that they've always been able to build up, uh, they're going to even uh, reduce the number of chances that are coming up against them and, and maintain this level of play because they're eight one and one to start the season. And you talk to John Stevens, he still thinks that there's another level that this team can get to. With John Rosen, the LA Kings insider, follow him on Twitter at LA Kings insider. He runs LA Kings insider.com as well. You know, you talk about this Boston game uh, heading into Saturday night, game five of a six game road trip in which the lone hiccup was against the Toronto Maple Leafs. 
is this a trip that kind of, even though they got off to a great start when they were at home, is this kind of solidifying uh, everything for them together and kind of rolling out some of the kinks and everything? Just, I feel like when teams go out on the road for an extended period of time, especially at the beginning of the season, it's the best thing for them in order to get that continuity and just gelling together as a squad. Yeah, that's been helpful, too. I mean, this is a team that also spent a week in China back in the preseason, and that went away towards towards really establishing some of the, you know, wrinkles that you would have necessarily with, with some of the newer players on the team. I know kind of the the group think going into the year was that the Kings didn't make a, a lot of wholesale changes. But then when you look at this team and some of the players that have been having big impact, you know, I've spoken about Alex Iafalo. Uh, there are other new players coming in as well. Christian Fullen has provided some good depth on the right side defensively, taking some minutes away from Drew Doughty, letting his game go out, breathe a little bit. Uh, also players, again, Adrian Kempe has had an impact so far this year. He's still technically a rookie. Uh, and then Oscar Fantenberg has been a really nice find, a KHL All-Star last year. He's 26 years old, also technically a rookie this year. Uh, a little bit more comfortable, and his best games have been at home, but he was quite good against Montreal the other night as well. He's been somebody, again, that plays with very good pace uh, and allows L.A. to, again, move the puck up ice quickly, get the hands of the, uh, the pucks into the hands of the forwards too. But, yes, I mean, the, the big question going into this road trip right now was how the Kings were going to fare without Jeff Carter. Already this has been a solid road trip, and they still have two games to play. Uh, Adrian Kempe has been a huge part of that so far. Uh, he comes in, he has six goals right now in the season, nine points in 10 games. They still, he's a 200 foot player. He still needs to be able to continue to be able to win face off. That's kind of been the bugaboo of his game right now. Um, but right now, the big question coming in, you know, you're going to get a better sense of where this team was facing all teams that were playoff teams a, a year ago on this road trip. They're three and one thus far winning in Columbus against a team that was a 108 point team a year ago. Another tough test in Boston. It ends in St. Louis two nights from now. Um, so far, all indications are that this team should uh, be able to get by uh, without a very, very important player in Jeff Carter uh, for a, a good portion of the season he's going to be missed. Yeah, absolutely. And you talk about Adrian Kempe. I mean, this young man through 10 games has been nothing short of uh, phenomenal. I mean, you see it, the size, the speed, the skill, he's got it all. Like you said, the lone hiccup, I guess, is the face-off percentage. Is, it's under 30%. You know, what was the reason why he was kind of, I guess you could say, a slow starter? His 25 games last year, um, you know, a small sample size or a decent enough sample size anyways. But, you know, what was the hiccup or what's been uh, the difference to his game this year as opposed to last year? More confidence, more regularity. He's still very young, 21 years old, inserting himself into the Calder uh, Trophy conversation early on in the season. This is somebody that has a, a good constitution to his game. His father is a development coach and has also been the GM of a team, I believe, in, in uh, Sweden's uh, fourth division as well. So he comes from a good pedigree of understanding and playing the game, too. Um, but he's always been among L.A.'s top prospects. He broke into North America uh, after a season with uh, Moto in the Swedish Elite League as a teenager at 18 years old. Wow. Uh, and then he, he played 17 postseason games during the Manchester Monarchs uh, in the Calder Cup run in 2015. Uh, and he scored eight times during that run, too. Um, you know, the, the team sees him as a player where he's never been a player that has scored regularly in his professional career. However, because of his speed, because of his shot, because of his smarts, his 200 foot play, they see that as something that will eventually develop into his game. He's shown the ability to score in bunches so far in his first two full AHL seasons, the last two years, wasn't really able to demonstrate that he was a regular scorer. You saw flashes of brilliance. Uh, but now, now that he's playing with a little bit better speed, or the players around him are a little bit better now, too, uh, his game is really flourishing. So, uh, again, he, he's another player that's going to be a player like like these L.A. Kings uh, regulars that you know of that, that are guys that were their best players are also guys that check well and play a 200-foot game, and he's certainly capable of that, too. Well, and you definitely want to see him kind of add that different dimension to uh, guys like, you know, Tyler Toffoli and Tanner Pearson, who at times, you know, obviously they have their slumps too, right? So, you know, if they if he brings that injection of energy and just that little bit of, uh, I guess, um, extra dimension to uh, their game, then, you know, he's obviously making that such a strong line, even without Carter uh, among it. And I want to talk a little bit about this is, 
kind of a selfish question on my part, but Mike Amadio is getting in his first NHL game against the Bruins today. Um, he was with the Brampton Battalion, was with the North Bay B- Battalion, and I worked for the Brampton Battalion for a while. So um, <laughs> I have to, I wanted to mention him for sure because he's one of those guys that literally hard work is what pays off, and that's what got him his success in junior hockey. And when you have a coach like Stan Butler, like he did throughout his entire junior career, I mean, there's nothing but good things to say about this young man. Where do you see him slotting in uh, in tonight's game against the Bruins? Well, he, he uh, definitely, again, another one of those players that has a good wherewithal playing underneath Sarge with the troops. Uh, <laughs> too, but he's a, a good two-way Two-way player, a former captain uh, when he was with uh, when the team had moved to North Bay, and in his 19-year-old season was a 50-goal scorer in the OHL. You know, it's not always easy to see 20-year-olds transfer that type of scoring. Obviously, he's not going to score 50 as, an, as a 20-year-old in the AHL, um, but did a very good job last year on the Ontario Reign. Uh, 41 points in 68 games that included 16 goals. So, you know, he's shown that he can be a scorer at the professional level. Um, that's still something where, when you get into the NHL level, that, that that's probably going to take some time to, to get along but he's going to skate uh, alongside uh, Andy Andrioff and Nick Dowd um, he can be a playmaking center but mostly a defensively responsible another LA King type 200 foot center um, you know a player that that uh, gets up and down the ice very well has very good speed has pretty good size and he's a little thick too a uh, good player that it's hard to knock off the puck um, but Amadio uh, you know a player again good constitution good head on his shoulders um, you look at the Ontario players, players that don't have to clear waivers now that the Kings have their affiliates so close by, uh, especially when they return home and when the rain returns return home, you know, from this road trip that they're on right now, um, they're going to rotate certain guys through the lineup. Um, you're going to see that defensively. It's going to be a meritocracy where players will have the opportunity to earn roles. If he goes out and earns it, he'll be able to stick. Um, but right now you're going to see him uh, because the team needed a center, Nick Shore uh, went down with an undisclosed injury, and he's day to day a little bit banged up. Uh, they decided to uh, put uh, Justin Auger back uh, with the Ontario Reign and recall Matteo. And um, you know we're we're expecting more more uh, smart, solid 200 foot play from him. Everything that you saw him do in uh, in Brampton and both uh, there in Nor- in North Bay. Well, John, thank you so much as always. Uh, very informative chat. Enjoy the game and the rest of the road trip. Thanks so much for doing this. Appreciate it, Michelle. Thank you so much for the invite. Thank you. That's John Rosen, LAKingsInsider.com. And you can follow him on Twitter at LAKingsInsider. And, you know, that's a scary thing. Having that many young guys that you can literally just insert, bring up, bring down. And I think this was a big reason why they decided to create all those three teams out in California, the Ontario Reign, you have the Barracuda, and then you have the San Diego Gulls. And I mean, how fantastic is that now that the travel for them isn't very far? You can insert a bunch of guys, see how they do uh, on the NHL ice versus, you know, in the A. And you're seeing it around uh, the league as well. You know, the Laval Rocket now in Montreal, instead of having to be out in St. John's, and even though, St. you know, the ice caps... Like, it sucks that they lost a team, but this is all logistics that are helping these NHL franchises having their AHL affiliates so close to home. You have it in Toronto as well with the Marlies and so on and so forth. So, I mean, it's just improving your player development um, when your guys are so close to the show, so to speak. Now we go from one eight one and one team to a nine one one team after the break. And Brian Burns is going to be joining us from TampaBayLightning.com. This is Hockey Primetime on Sirius XM NHL Network Radio and streaming live on HockeyPrimetime.com and all of our social media pages powered by Primetime Radio.
Puck alive. Kucherov right circle. Kucherov. Shoot! Score! Well, he went seven games in a row with a goal. He did not score in game eight, but he's right back in the goal department as far as scoring in game nine. He makes it one nothing lightning. Mata trying to clear it. Lost to Kucherov. Kucherov trying to hold it in the offensive zone. Well, for Hedman, back for Kucherov, right circle. Kitty Kucherov sets up on the power play. Right circle, Kalorn. Right circle, Kucherov. Right corner to Metzikov. In front, snap goes. Score! What a passing play! Stamkos buries it off a cross-eyed speed for the Mets to come. It's 2 nothing Lightning. Welcome back to Hockey Prime Time. Michelle Strino filling in for Connor McKenna, enjoying himself at Game 4 of the World Series. Not as good as Game 4 of the Stanley Cup Finals would be, but I'm biased. Enjoy yourself, Connor. Either way. A little bit later on in the show, we'll be talking to Isabel Kershudian, who covers the Caps for the Washington Post. We'll be speaking to Joe Yearden as well, who covers the Sabres for NHL.com. The Sabres, unfortunately, 3-2 losers at home to the San Jose Sharks earlier on Saturday. And at the top of the clock, we'll get to Christopher Martell as well from Fox Sports Tennessee talking about those Nashville Predators. But joining me on the line to talk about the dynamic duo and why not, because... Uh, the Tampa Bay Lightning, 9-1-1 one, one to open this season. Brian Burns, who is with TampaBayLightning.com. Brian, thank you so much for joining us today on Hockey Prime Time. Yeah, absolutely, Michelle. Thanks for having me on. So before we get into all the, uh, I guess, uh, stats and everything that has to go along with uh, Stammer and Kucherov, uh, can you give me a little bit of, a, I guess, a, a story about Miss a little man named uh, Weston Herman, 11-year-old Lightning fan uh, who got to go to the game day skate on Saturday? Yeah, uh, Weston is a, uh, a PDS, and he was uh, part of uh, head coach John Cooper does a uh, – a uh, couple days before the season, uh, they did it for uh, the second uh, year this season, uh, right before a couple days before the uh, the start of the regular season. It's something that they hope to do annually. Uh, and Weston was out there uh, taking part in that fishing tournament and got to know uh, Coach Cooper and a lot of the guys. And he was invited back uh, this morning. And then uh, as things were wrapping up, uh, he was able to actually take drills. He did. We're going to call Brian back because unfortunately we had a tough connection there. Uh, he was talking about Weston Herman, who is uh, an 11 year old Lightning fan who was diagnosed with brain cancer uh, in 2014, and he led the morning stretch uh, this morning at the uh, game day skate. Uh, he worked on face-offs. He even put a, a few shots on Peter Budai. And uh, this is all part and parcel from uh, one of the three initiatives that the NHL has in, of course, uh, Hockey Fights Cancer. And it's a fantastic initiative in which uh, you give young people um, these opportunities, you know, really of a lifetime. And, you know, he obviously had uh, a great time and you heard a little bit of uh, how they got to know Weston in the fishing tournament um, or in the off season as well. So uh, just one of the great things that is phenomenal about uh, the initiatives that the NHL has in uh, hockey fights cancer. So you're getting so many different, you're getting to see two players really connect with fans and you're getting to see how good they are as people as well. And as Brian rejoins us, Brian, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. There here. we go. A little bit better now. Um, I was just All giving right, everyone good. a little bit of a synopsis of uh, Western Herman. He got a, a chance to uh, do the morning stretch and work some face-offs and even get a few shots on Peter Budai here as well. Right. Yeah. He was able to work a, a couple two on ones with, uh, with Steven Stamkos feeding them pucks. And wow. He to, yeah. He got the, the NHL's leading assist man feeding you uh, right on the back <laughs> door. So it was a big day for Weston. He was able to put a couple past Peter Budai uh, during the, towards the end of the, of the bolts morning skate. And then uh, Stammer invited him into the, 
the middle of the stretch circle to lead the guys and in, in the stretching. And he was able to, you know, had a pretty full day. He got to watch a little bit of practice and he got to go out and participate with the guys and did even did a little bit of work after some of the guys went out. So it was a pretty big day for him. Wow. I, you know, when I see and hear these stories, it, you know, it makes my day when I hear stuff like this because uh, this is what we should be doing all the time for each other. So it's fantastic. And uh, getting the fact that, you know, probably your favorite player, or his favorite player and Steven Stamkos and such a huge NHL superstar and knowing the kind of start that him and Kucherov, they're on a, just a completely different level uh, this year, Brian. And what are you seeing between these two guys in terms of that kind of connection as well as on the power play? And even though it took them oh, I don't know, three weeks for the power play to be the best in the league. I kind of called it on, like, game one. Between those two and Nemesnikov, like, it, it's, like, seamless passing between those three guys um, on top of you having Hedman on the back end there. And just, it, there's so many threats. Who do you cover when you're a man down? And just maybe to talk a little bit about the kind of connection that Stamkos and Kucherov have this year and obviously that number one power play unit. Yeah, you kind of hit the nail on the head there with the uh, with the passing. Just the way that these guys are able to connect with one another. It's kind of like they're seeing plays, uh, a couple passes in front of each other. They just kind of know where each other is going to be at all times on the ice, and they're able to uh, to put pucks in the areas uh, and let the other guy run onto it. Uh, and it's really worked out well. And uh, you know, the, the thing with the power plays, you've got Stamkos in one circle and everybody knows what kind of one timer he has from the left circle. And then you've got Kucherov in the right circle. And I think people are starting to figure out, you know, what kind of shot he has now. Uh, you got Hedman at the point who's helping to facilitate between the two. Uh, and it's really just kind of pick your poison for the, uh, for the opposing penalty kill is if you shade towards Kucherov, then he's going to be able uh, to dish it across the ice for Stamkos and set up that one timer. If you pay too much attention to Stamkos, uh, you know, Kucherov has probably the most deceptive shot in the NHL right now. Uh, and he's a danger anytime he gets the puck. Uh, and then you've got Alex Kalorn that's been in the middle and he's just been kind of facilitating and distributing and doing those things in the middle to, to keep attention away from Stamkos and Kucherov. And uh, like you mentioned before, Vladimir Mesnikov is kind of an underrated player. He plays with, uh, with Stamkos and Kucherov on that top line. And he also gets on that top penalty kill. Uh, and he's just kind of roaming around behind the net you know, just trying to keep pucks alive uh, and, and doing what he can to, to get the puck into a position for Kucherov and Stamkos where they can fire off those one-timers. You know, can you talk maybe a little bit about just the feeling, the attitude, the positivity? It, it, you could tell these guys are like kids in a candy shop every single time they get to go out there and play a game together because everybody is healthy. Just what they've had to go through over the last, you know, two years or so in terms of those kind of health issues. Obviously, number 91 is at the top of that list. Uh, but just it's this it, renewed uh, invigoration uh, amongst everyone on the team. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even without Stamkos last year, and they also, uh, you know, they lost Tyler Johnson for a little bit. They lost Andre Pilat for a little bit. Braden Point, who had a great rookie season, they lost him for about a month, uh, about midway through that season. Even with all those injuries, they still felt like uh, they were a good enough team where they should have made the postseason last year. Uh, and then you, uh, you, you look at what Nashville was able to do, getting in as the number eight seed and taking it all the way to the Stanley Cup final. I really feel like the Lightning – thought that if they were able to get into the postseason last year, the way they were playing at the end of the year, that they would be able to make some noise. Uh, so they came in this year with just a kind of a renewed energy. You know, they had a longer off season, which hasn't been the case for them for the last two or three seasons. Uh, so they were able to rest up guys that were, were dealing with little injuries that they kept kind of creeping up. They were able uh, to take care of those during the off season and everybody came in, came in just kind of healthy, uh, refreshed. They were ready to go right from the start. Uh, a lot was made last year about the poor start that they had coming out of the gates. Uh, really wasn't until after the new year, uh, really even until after the all-star break when they were kind of able to put things together and they were kind of mediocre up to that point. So there was just a really renewed focus on getting off to a good start. Uh, and you're seeing that now. No, well, absolutely. And, you know, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Andre Vasilevsky as well, because even though he's not getting the start on Saturday, Peter Budai is getting just a second start in the 12th game of the season for uh, the Bolts. 
Is that kind of the idea? Because Vasilevsky's this 23 year old, uh, you know, phenom kind of thing between the pipes, and John Cooper's pretty much just gonna, you know, ride the hot hand and go with that horse because of the fact that he's 23 and he can play as much as he wants. Yeah, and he, you know, he's been splitting time the last few years. He, he was splitting time with Ben Bishop. Uh, and then last year at the trade deadline, once Bishop w- was traded uh, and Vasilevsky became the man, uh, I think that role just really suited him. It, it was kind of difficult for the two of those guys, for Bishop and Vasilevsky, to handle that, that goaltender split. Yeah. Uh, and for Vasilevsky, he talked about it a lot last year, how uh, it was difficult for him to know. Uh, you know, what game is he going to get into? He would go, you know, 10 games, two weeks uh, between starts. And he's a guy that, that needs regular action. He needs regular starts. And he wants to play every game. Uh, I don't know necessarily that, that John Cooper would have would have started Andre Vasilevsky this many games this early in the season uh, if he weren't just playing lights out for them uh, to start the season. I, I think that's kind of forced Cooper's hand more than anything. Uh, it's just the way that Andre Vasilevsky has been playing uh, and Cooper's been a coach that, that when he has a winning lineup and the guys are playing well, he likes to stick with that lineup. He doesn't like to tinker with things and just let those guys go and, and ride them until uh, you know a change needs to be made. Uh, so I think that's more than anything why we've seen Vasilevsky uh, so much here early on is just his outstanding play and the way that the, the team has been responding behind him. Uh, with, with that said, Peter Budai had a pretty good start his first time uh, seeing the ice this season up in New Jersey. He kind of uh, had a shaky first period. He gave up three goals in that first period, and it's tough for him because he hadn't been in live game action for, for quite some time. Uh, and then once he got that first period out of the way, uh, he really settled down in the second and third, uh, only gave up one more goal the rest of the way, helped the Lightning uh, get a point out of out of New Jersey, and that was really the last loss that they've had. So uh, it will be important for the Lightning tonight. Uh, to play a little better in front of Budai in that first period and let him get his feet underneath him and get into the game. Because what we've seen, once he gets into the game, he, he's pretty solid himself. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we've seen what he's been able to do in terms of come in 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 situations in which he becomes the number one goaltender. And I'm not saying that's going to happen. Knock on wood, we always want good health for your netminders. But he was able to uh, go in for Jonathan Quick and play long stretches, playing very well. Uh, He was able a few years ago to do the same thing for Carey Price when he went down as well. So he is one of the more uh, capable backups in the NHL. And I thought that was a a fantastic uh, signing in the offseason. Now, one final question before we let you go. We obviously have to bring up Mikhail Sergachev because this young man, um, I think has just, to me, overstepped and overshadowed anything I had expected of him so far this season. I did not expect him uh, to step into this lineup and make the kind of contributions that he has already. And he's just been so phenomenal this year. Just talk a little bit about um, Sergachev and just, you know, John Cooper and uh, how he utilizes him. Yeah, I mean he's been getting some some power play time. He's been a good threat on the uh, on the second power play unit, kind of spelling Victor Hedman uh, in that role. And he he's been getting some some points in, in that regard, setting up other guys. And he's gotten a couple goals in that way as well. Uh, he's really been a surprise. I, I think you know just watching him during the preseason and training camp, I think everybody felt pretty good uh, that he was going to be a solid defenseman for this team this year. Uh, I, I think everyone pretty much expected that he was going to be with the team for the duration that they weren't going to send him back uh, to juniors. There was that 10 game threshold that just came up a couple games ago. Uh, and really it was kind of a, a foregone conclusion that he was going to be here uh, with the lightning at, at that point. Uh, but one thing that gets kind of lost with the start that the lightning have had this year and all the offensive threats that they've had, uh, Victor Hedman really hasn't gotten going offensively. And if you look at them last year at the lightning you know, he was kind of their horse down, yeah. the, uh, down the stretch for that team. I mean, he had a phenomenal year last year. He finished third in the Norse Trophy uh, voting. Uh, but he really hasn't gotten going this year, uh, offensively at least. He's been uh, spectacular defensively. But offensively, the points haven't been there like they were last year. And Mikhail Sergachev has really helped uh, to kind of fill that void uh, that the Lightning would have uh, if he wasn't there. You know, he's he's really been uh, – setting up the guys well. He, he's looking for a shot. He, you look at the stat sheet uh, after a game, and he's got four or five shots a game. He's really looking uh, to put the puck on the net. Uh, he's creating a lot, uh, and he's playing really well defensively. And he's partner. He's got a great defensive partner with Anton Strawman. Uh, it's a really good partner for, the, for him to have because Strawman, 
Uh, he's a veteran guy in this league. And John Cooper has always talked about, you know, Anton Strowman's probably not going to win a Norris trophy, but his partner is going to have a really good chance to just because of the way that he plays and the way he communicates and uh, he's able to partner with his defensive pair. Uh, so that's been a, a really big help for Mikhail Sergachev too, to help him get his feet wet in the NHL in this early start to his career. Well, 10 points in 11 games is a pretty darn good start. And I like uh, the confidence of the young man, too. Uh, the amount of times I've seen him kind of pinch into the slot and kind of call for the puck and just uh, his awareness is fantastic. And uh, so far, not only do you have Stamkos and Kucherov uh, lighting up the league, but I feel like everybody's just kind of a joy to watch with the Tampa Bay Lightning right now as they kind of uh, run the table with uh, everyone in the NHL. And up next is the Anaheim Ducks on Saturday. Brian, thank you so much for doing this. We really appreciate the time. Absolutely, Michelle. Thanks for having me on. That's Brian Burns, Tampa Bay uh, Lightning reporter for TampaBayLightning.com. At B Burns NHL is how you contact him through social media so coming up after the break we have to tee up our two with our own laura saba as well and maybe we'll get her take as well on mikhail sergachev is that another salt in the wound for montreal canadians fans knowing that Druan is off to a kind of a cold start too this is hockey primetime on sirius xm nhl network radio and streaming live on hockeyprimetime.com and all of our social media pages powered by primetime radio here on hockey prime time if you want to follow us on twitter by the way at hockey prime time at michelle storino is how you contact us facebook.com slash hockey prime time as well so laura yes. we're gonna bring you in quickly <laughs> before the top of the clock Mikhail Sergachev, is that salt in the wound or what? It is a little bit. Um, I have to say, I'm not disappointed about the Durant trade to begin with. I think he's a very talented player. And I think it's one of those cases where he just needed a change of scenery. I think he's going to do really well in Montreal. He's certainly one of the most talented players that the Habs have been able to bring in via trade. So, you know, there's a lot of pluses. But if there were a way that we could have 
uh, Jonathan Drouin in Montreal and also um, as fans have Mikhail Ser Sergachev because it seems like the team itself has not been valuing defensemen as much as possible or they haven't been valuing talent or potential as much as they could and a lot of this is hindsight is 2020 right there's a lot of players like he hadn't even made the team so how were we to know that he was going to be so great and do so great in Tampa and the pieces in Tampa like the other players that he's playing with in Tampa like do um or helping him have this fantastic start. Whereas in Montreal, uh, it seems like the good players are being lost via trade. Um, and then, or, you know, in terms of Markov, he wasn't re-signed. And then the Habs are not replacing the talent. So while I'm not upset that the Habs have got, um, managed to get, obtain uh, Jonathan Duran in the trade. And, and I really do think that his years in Montreal are going to be fantastic on a personal uh, level. On uh, I don't know how the team's going to do, but I, I certainly think that he's going to do well. And the Habs, are, are, the Habs fans are going to enjoy his time here. But it's always a little bit of a salt in a wound when you think when 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 you're looking at the team's woes right now, and you think that they could use a player like Sergachev at this at this time. And I think too, because the thought was, okay, well, Sergachev will be the defenseman of the future for Tampa Bay, not the defenseman of right now. Like one minute, kind right. of, yeah, right. Like obviously, hindsight's twenty twenty. You didn't really think he was going to make the team, uh, you know this year but then you know you can also look at Victor Mete he came into the lineup and he's paired with uh Shea Weber right so you have uh Sergachev with Anton Strahlman and then you have uh Mete with Shea Weber on the other side of the coin right so I mean yeah you would rather have the extra offense that Sergachev brings you but you can't really be that disappointed when you have uh, 19 year olds uh, Victor Mete in the lineup Not and at all. uh you know, yes. so you got to pick your poison, like you said, right? <laughs> and I 100% uh, agree with 30 seconds. Coming up, hour two, we have Christopher Martel talking Preds, Joe Yurden talking Sabres, and Isabel Kershudian talking those Capitals. All that as hockey prime time continues right here on Sirius XM NHL Network Radio, streaming live on hockeyprimetime.com and all of our social media pages powered by Primetime Radio.
back out high again. Now Hartnell coming toward the net, got knocked down. Buck comes out in front for the jam, and on the opening, Forsberg got the job done. Predators take a one nothing lead, a power play goal at 629. This is hour two of Hockey Prime Time. You may have noticed I'm not Connor McKenna. I'm Michelle Storino. Welcome to the program. In hour one, we talked a little bit about the LA Kings with John Rosen, the Kings insider, and with Brian Burns, who is the reporter at TampaBayLightning.com as well, two of the top teams both in the East and the West. Hour two shaping up. Talking a little bit about the Capitals later on in the program, the Sabres as well with Isabel Kershudian and Joe Yearden coming up and joining now us on the line to talk about those Nashville Predators, Christopher Martell, who covers the Preds for Fox Sports Tennessee and co-hosts the Neutral Zone on 104.5 The Zone. Thanks so much for joining us today, Chris. Michelle, it's my pleasure. How are you? Good, thank you. So, I got to ask you, the Preds coming off a big 2-1 win over Chicago on Friday. 43 saves by Rene. Is that so far his best performance of the season, you think? No, absolutely. I mean, Rene played fantastic against Calgary just earlier in the week. And that, to my, uh, you know, in my opinion, that was his best performance of the year, even though they lost that game in the shootout. But going into Chicago, a place... Uh, where Rene had won two of his last three games going back to the playoffs. And, you know, granted, he probably should have pulled that game out uh, in overtime if it wasn't for a, um, we'll say, a missed call uh, with Ryan Hartman throwing Matt Irwin's stick 600 miles across the earth. Uh, (laughs) In my opinion, his 43 saves against Chicago last night was absolutely phenomenal. He was standing on his head the entire night, and what we're seeing right now is a lot of carryover uh, from uh, the success he had in the playoffs last season all the way leading up to the Stanley Cup final. And I can't think it's, it could be any better than what we're getting from Rene right now. So if this, as long as this can carry on we, and we continue to see these kind of performances for Pekka Rene, uh, it, could be, uh, it could spell some really solid success for the Preds uh, down the road. You know, we talk about Rene and then, you know, we've had conversations earlier in the show about – having formidable backups in the NHL and being able to get those, regardless of how many games they start, whether it's uh, in the 10 to 15 range or if it's in the the 20 range, um, you need those wins or you need at least partial points. So far, UC Soros hasn't been the same guy as last season. Any part of his game concern you so far? Not really. I I think a lot of it has been defensive lapses, um, really by the, the players in front of him. And I think still, based on what I see from Soros uh, in his starts so far for the Preds, he, he's looked fine. It's just uh, the players in front of him have been playing spectacularly. But I think one of the things we really need to look for, especially with Soros and Rene, is that he gets those 20-ish starts like he had last season because with, with Pekka Rene, he needs to have that rest. And yeah. that's really what helped him. That's really what helped him get to the Stanley Cup final last season was he only played, you know, a late 50s or only about 60 games last season. So with that kind of rest, it absolutely helped him. And he, didn't, he wasn't tired going into the playoffs. So uh, Saros, I don't think there's anything wrong with this game. Uh, I'm, I'm happy with what I've seen so far from him. Uh, I think we're probably going to see him get the start tonight uh, against the Islanders. It wouldn't surprise me. Uh, so as long as that continues, I guess, it should be uh, it should be okay, especially for the backup situation. And we'll hope to probably see between 25-ish starts for him this year. Wow. We're with Christopher Martell. You can follow him on Twitter at KMartell underscore sports. He covers the Preds for Fox Sports Tennessee and also co-hosts the Neutral Zone on 104.5 The Zone. You heard a uh, goal scored by Philip Forsberg, and you talked about uh, just the carryover from last season. And obviously, Phil is one of those guys that has had a fantastic car- carryover so far this season. He's got seven goals, 12 points. But then things like, or performances so far, like uh, Ryan Johansson, 10 games in, no goals. Uh, Kevin Fiala, nine games in, no goals. Any of those kind of stats alarm you? at all the fact that these two guys um, especially without a Nick Bonino in the lineup your number two center you need that 
extra bit of offense, and you thought you were definitely going to get that from, say, a youngster like Kevin Fiala this season. Yeah, you know, uh, Ryan Johansson doesn't bother me as much as, as Kevin Fiala. Johansson is, is more of a playmaker, and that's, that's really how I've stressed it to a lot of people I've talked with that have asked me that question. Uh, I really look at Johansson as the person who, who tosses the puck off to uh, other players like Arvidsson, like Forsberg, for them to really uh, get those goals and contribute offensively. He gets those assists and points, and, and right now, you know, he's got no goals, but six points on the season and, and that so far he's been playing spectacular Kevin Fiala has been playing good but n- it just hasn't translated on the score sheet and I think one of the biggest things of, uh, that's frustrated him is just his inability to find the back of the net so far and that really kind of uh, came to a head against <laughs> Calgary earlier in the week where it was just I mean he absolutely whiffed on on a puck uh, and yes it was balancing people will people will get on my case about that yeah the puck was balancing but there wasn't a person within 10 feet of Fiala. If he would have waited just a couple of seconds and corralled the puck, it would have been an easy tap-in. But instead, he wound up like Shea Weber was shooting a 108-mile slap shot and was trying to hit it towards the net. So it's one of those things I really think you've seen that level of frustration from Fiala. But in the same regard, I think he's going to be all right. It's just once he finds the back of the net, I think then the floodgates are going to open and we're going to see a lot more offense coming from him. Yeah, absolutely. Um, moving kind of down the lineup and talking a little bit about some of the guys on the back end, uh, to me, to be completely honest, someone that's kind of adopted a little bit better than I thought he was going to has been Alexi Yemelin so far because you have this dynamic uh, defense group or defense court um, with the guys that you have back there. Obviously, you have the P.K. Subans and the Roman Yossis and the Matias Ekholms, and you are without Ryan Ellis. However, I mean, a guy like Alexi, Alexi Emelin, he's almost like an old-school type of a defenseman. Um, what have you liked about his game so far? You know, I was really kind of interested to see the dynamic that Emelin was going to bring to the Predators when the season started earlier during training camp, he was being paired with Sue Bannon. There was, there was a lot of intrigue as to how that pairing would do because they only spent, you know, I, I believe the number was about 58 or so minutes between like paired with each other while Sue Bannon was in Montreal. And, that, and realistically, that's not a lot of time. No. Pairing. Yeah. And so when he started this, started the year with Nashville, I think the, the first couple of games uh, against Boston and Pittsburgh, that pairing got exposed a little bit. And, you know, it really reflects on the scoreboard. But since then, Yemlin's really kind of locked it down. And I've really been pleased with what we've seen so far out of him. Uh, he's a heavy hitter. I mean, he lit up Curtis Lazar for the Flames two or three times into the boards uh, earlier in the week. And that, those were just – and I keep bringing up that Flames game, but it was just – those kind of hits are literally what stick in your mind – and not just that, but he has made some spectacular plays as well. He has been exposed a few times defensively, but the plays he's made since then have really kind of redeemed uh, redeemed him in that sense. I think he's been perfect with Subban, uh, and I, I've liked him whenever he's been matched up with, or been paired with any other defenseman on the team. So right now I think it's looking like a pretty good pretty good deal that the Predators were able to get him uh, from, the, from the Vegas Golden Knights. Uh, Before we let you go, they're hosting uh, an Islander team that is on the rise now. They're starting to get some uh, guys clicking on offense. Um, How do you see this game kind of transpiring? Obviously, you have to, you know, contain guys like uh, John Tavares, Anders Lee, Brock Nelson. Um, But how do you see this one playing out being the second game of a back-to-back now? Yeah, being on the tail end of a back-to-back is always very interesting. And seeing that they'll probably – I mean, my guess is they start UC Saros tonight. Uh, and that being the case, you usually with the backup uh, backup in net, you tend to see teams play a little bit better defensively. I mean, so far this season, Nashville hasn't, hasn't really played better defensively with Saros in net. But I kind of expect it to be uh, – I don't really think it's going to be a high-scoring affair. I see more like a 3-2 score game. And um, I'm really um, – interested to see how they come uh, if they if they actually fall back to earth after a two to one victory over Chicago one where they increasingly dominated in the third period but uh, I'm, I'm interested to see if if they're going to really carry that over tonight because after tonight they're going on a California road trip where they're going to see some real heavy hitters so 
against an Eastern Conference opponent where it's really not going to impact in a point swing on the Western side, this is the one where they need to get some points. And, and personally, I think they're going to, I think they're going to come away with the victory tonight, but I think it's going to be a real close game. Yeah. And uh, you know, you got to think everyone kind of hates going on those Western conference road swings, whether it's, you know, Western Canada or going through California, because it, it is always tough. You're out of your routine. And I mean, all those teams are difficult to play against. Now in Western Canada, all those teams are difficult to play against. As we saw, uh, you know, the Canucks are third in the Pacific. I don't know who thought that was going to actually be uh, a thing that we're talking about this far into the season. And I know we're only three and a half weeks in, but, you know, out Western Canada, all those teams are very tough to play against. And then, of course, the California road trip is always uh, the toughest one, in my estimation, for any team on the schedule. So, uh, like you said, you got to get the points where you can, especially on home ice at Bridgestone um, and against a team like the Islanders where, you know, to me, I kind of feel like they're a Jekyll, Jekyll and Hyde situation as well, where, you know, you see what they're kind of capable of and they do have some really good young parts on the back end uh, as well. But then again, you could get, you know, a, a bad goaltending performance too. You know what I mean? Like you, there's so many different aspects to this Islander team that I really don't know what to make of them. So if you can, even though it's the second game of back-to-back, at least get a point out of this entire situation, then you're looking all right heading out west yeah and that was my that was exactly what i explained uh, on my show earlier this week on the neutral zone uh what my co-host had asked me you know what do you think about the islanders game on saturday and i said sometimes i really don't know what to expect <laughs> the islanders uh whether they're going to whether they're going to come in and they're going to trounce you five to one or it's going to be a close three to two game and, and that's the thing is they're always like you said they're always a jekyll and hyde kind of team and of the three games that we analyzed for the upcoming week uh, I said I, I thought they were going to beat Chicago in Chicago, and this is the one of the three games that I talked about could have either have gone either way. And so while I think the Preds can come away with the victory tonight, I mean, he could easily go the other way. And yeah. that, that's my biggest concern with the Islanders is you never know which team you're going to face. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Chris, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Uh, really appreciate it. We look forward to speaking with you in the future. My pleasure, Michelle. Thank you for having me. That's Christopher Martel, who covers the Preds for Fox Sports Tennessee. He also co-hosts the Neutral Zone on 104.5 The Zone. You could follow him on Twitter at kmartel underscore sports. Coming up after the break, we're going to switch gears a little bit, head over to the Eastern Conference. And before we get to the Caps, a little bit later on in the program, we are going to talk to Joe Yearden from NHL.com about the Buffalo Sabres, who unfortunately came away in another loss, this time on home ice, to the San Jose Sharks. Uh, The lone afternoon tilt in the NHL on Saturday with 12 games on the docket. So we'll talk to him about that. And if you didn't already know, it's Jack Eichel's 21st birthday. How he celebrated? Uh, Not the greatest way. We'll talk about that and much more as Hockey Primetime continues on Sirius XM NHL Network Radio and streaming live on HockeyPrimetime.com and all of our social media pages powered by Primetime Radio.
Plays it ahead to Eichel. He carries right wing to center. Hit over the line. Eichel finds his way through. Scores! It's a jack attack to put the Sabres up 2-1 with 2.40 to go in period number one. Happy birthday, Jack Eichel. Now he can legally drink in the United States. He's 21. Michelle Storino in for Connor McKenna. This is Hockey Prime Time. You can communicate with us through social media. It's a new thing. It's a new fad. All the kids are doing it. At Hockey Prime Time on Twitter. Facebook.com slash Hockey Primetime. If you want to follow myself on Twitter, at Michelle Storino is how you do so. Michelle with two L's, by the way. Joining us on the line to talk a little bit about Jack Attack and how he spent his 21st birthday is Joe Yurden from NHL.com. Joe, we're reunited at last. How are you? At long last. It's been a <laughs> while, Michelle. It's nice to talk to you again. Yes, exactly. Uh, same goes to you. So, not the greatest of gifts. Now, prior to the game against the Sharks on Saturday, uh, he was demoted to the second power play unit. Did you read really anything into that based on the fact that he was still technically with Kane and Pominville on that second unit, right? Yeah, it's, I, I don't know. The, the only way to really differentiate between the two units is who the, who the defensemen are. On those on those groups because it's it's a bit of a drop off with the injuries involved with the team, but I, I I'm not looking too much into it. They're they're trying to spark some goals, and I don't blame Phil Housley for trying to shuffle things around and see see what combinations work with with everybody else. So I I you know it it's fine. Jack I mean Jack's the guy kind of driving the bus as it is already this season. He's factored in on so many goals. So when it, when it comes to the power play thing, just you know, try to find a group that works and try to cut down on the shorthanded goals against, too. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, after this 3-2 loss on Saturday, um, I hear he kind of broke his stick in frustration in the hallway. Is this a, a correct rumor that I heard? Well, I, I I had to be in the Sharks room afterwards. I oh, not. come on, Joe. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, I'm kidding. I know. Well, well, to be fair, those guys are, are, are headed back to the room before we're even downstairs. So if he did do that, I mean, that's, I mean, he's frustrated and he wants to score goals and he had one taken off the board today uh, in a, you know, rather dubious uh, replay challenge by the Sharks. But, you know, I mean, he, he, I thought Jack played pretty well today. I mean, he was, he was, on, he was on the puck. He was all over the place. He was generating a lot of shots. Something he hadn't really been doing in previous games was taking shots today, second period especially. He was he was very much active in the offensive zone, taking shots, trying to get things going. And, you know, we need more of that from Jack in, the, in Buffalo, and I think that's that, that's the big thing for him is he's got to take charge, he's got to take control like that more often because I mean he he is the, the the most offensively talented player on this team. There's a lot of very good talent on this team, but he's the number one guy. Well, and you know with the off-season contract and obviously everything that he said at the end of last year and then all the changes that happened uh, in the off-season and bringing in Phil Housley, he wants to be that guy. So, you know, it's just, I, I guess, a whole, you know, issue of him kind of living up to his own expectations, I guess, his own, the battle within himself, so to speak. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, he's taken ownership of, of everything that he said last year and everything that's played out. And I mean, he's been, he's been much more of an adult this year, which I mean, it sounds goofy because he's been <laughs> mostly an adult. I mean, he's, you know, you know birthday and, and whatever, but I mean, he's been, you know, very accountable for everything. I mean, he's, he's doing all the classic things you want from your leader. He's, you know, he stays in the room, you know, to the very end, he, he's hanging around. He's always available to talk to, and he gives very. He's been giving very thoughtful, very leadership sort of type of answers to, to all of his questions. So, I mean, he did a lot of growing up this summer, and it's very evident in how he carries himself. And I think, you know, now it's now it's the the, the part of things where you know, if, if this is going to be his team, and it is, I mean, it is his team, but he's got to he's got to kind of drive things now. And I think that part of that is, is started coming out in the last few games. Can I ask you? In terms of a guy like Evander Kane, is it kind of a foregone conclusion in that locker room or in and around that team that he's probably not going to be around come February, early March? No, I don't. I don't necessarily get the feeling that that's the case. I mean, sometimes with guys, you 
you just know. I mean, the last few years there's been a few trades here, and you know, you <laughs> some, with some guys, some guys you kind of got the feeling that at some point they knew they were going to go. I mean, I, I think back to Drew Stafford and you know, coincidentally enough, that was the Evander Kane trade with Winnipeg. But you know, with Drew Stafford, you, you kind of got the feeling you know it was his, you know it was his last season on a contract, and you were like, well, this team's not going anywhere right now he's probably not going to be here till the end. And that was, that was not the case. And you, you kind of got the idea that was going to happen, but I think with Evander, it's too early for that right now. And I mean, they're not, I mean, they're not out of the hunt or any, by any stretch of the means, but you know, it's been a rough start, but I think this is a team where if they're sniffing around at a playoff spot at any, at any point, you know, towards the middle part of the season, that that's when the decision gets a lot harder, whether or not it's time to move on from them. Or if you're going to entertain the thought of extending them, you, you better get that done before the season's up because once you get to July 1st, who knows what happens at that point. And if you're Buffalo, you don't want to lose them for nothing. And that's, that's where the decision comes to, to say either you're going for it or you're going you're gonna to cash out. With Joe Yurden from NHL.com, he covers the Sabres. At Joe Yurden is how you follow him on Twitter. You know, looking up and down this lineup in terms of the secondary scoring, it's kind of non-existent. And that's just me trying to be nice about it. Um, For you, who do you think needs to step up the most? I'm seeing a guy like Sam Reinhart when, you know, I'm watching some of these games. I don't notice him a lot of the time. Um, And, you know, still a guy like Kyle Pozo without a goal this season. And he's yeah. definitely one of your leaders on this team, and you need him to score as well. Yeah, those are the two that stand out very obviously that you need more from him. You know, and Kyle's Kyle's frustrated. You can you can tell in talking to him, you can tell in watching him in practice. I mean, I think back to practice. I think it was yesterday. You know, they were running some drills, and you know, he missed out on a shot, or, or something came up short for him, and you know, he skates to the skates to the bench and smashes a stick and grabs another one. And, wow. You know, it's, the pressure's on, you know, he wants, you know, the team's struggling. He knows he has to do better and he knows he has to score for them to be a successful team. And, you know, I think with Sam's case, Sam's, his situation's so different because he's back to playing center again. You know, he's playing center on what's essentially the third line with, with Justin Bailey and Ben Gaskirgensen. And, you know, those are, those are good guys, but, you know, they, they have to make those matchups work a little bit better. And, you know, Sam's got to be more of a factor. I and mean, we've seen Sam on the power play. He's been good at the net front. You know, he's maybe a little bit too good at the net front today in the, in the goal that was disallowed. But, um, you know, it's, it's one of these things where it's with Sam, I got a feeling it's, it's going to come and it's going to come for Kyle, too. But it's it's so hard when when everything is, is not going in and the bounces aren't going your way. And it just seems like everything's piling up on you. It's, very, it's super pessimistic and it's not enjoyable. But, you know, for these guys, they're they're, they're working hard. It's not that that's not the case, but. You know, the one area where they could use a lot of help is from the defense. They don't have any goals from, from defensemen yet this season. And so we know in this league, you got to have guys on the blue line that can score for you. Yeah, absolutely. Or at least, you know, move the puck. And the the thing about the back end, though, is that there has been such a large overhaul in terms of who's back there. You know, you have Marco Scandella. Uh, Nathan Boyu has played eight games, but you also have Matt Tennyson. Uh, in there too so you're getting some unfamiliar guys um, kind of readjusting all the while you are still adjusting to a brand new coach um, is it going to be to me I feel like there's enough here in Buffalo that it's just a matter of time until they kind of even things out so to speak I, I don't really know how to but things will start to go their way. And I don't want to, you know what I mean? And I know how pessimistic uh, Sabres fans are and you are in Buffalo. So you hear it and you see it um, all the time for the last 10 years, basically. But I just feel like there will be a time in which things will start to turn their way and this ship will kind of have smoother sailing, so to speak. Yeah. And I mean, honestly, the, getting guys healthy on the defense is, is the biggest part. I and mean, Jason Bottrell, the, the, the main thing he did in the summer was to, to load up on defense and, and say, you know, we're not going to have the depth problems that we, that this team's had in the past few years where one injury would set them back. Well, in this case, they've got about four. Yeah. And when, when you're without three or four guys that, that maybe you were counting on to be in your top six, that's really hard to make up for. And, you know, it's, very clear that they they want their younger players to to get more experience in the AHL and to not bull rush them right into the NHL and say all right guys figure it out because 
if that was the case, Brendan Gooley would already be up, you know, trying to play 20 minutes a night on defense. And, you know, for a kid that's 19, 20 years old, it's, it's tough. And, you know, with this group now, I mean, you're without the goes and you're without Bull, oh, you, you're, you know, Georges is banged up. Yeah. You know, all these guys, Justin Falk is her, you know, guys that are veterans and that can be helpful aren't there. And especially in the case with Bull, you the goes and those are guys that you're banking on to play 20 minutes and, you know, 20 minutes a night and, and kind of take the pressure off of Scandella and Ristolainen. And instead, you got Scandella and Ristolainen playing nearly 30 minutes a night. And you have to, you know, spell guys like, Victor Antipin, who's new to the NHL, and Zach Redman, who's kind of a journeyman. And same goes for Matt Tennyson, where he's just always been a number seven type of defense. Yeah, and he's played every now, game. Now, now he's, yeah. yeah, he's played every game, and he's playing 20 minutes, you know, 20 plus minutes a night. I don't think that's any, anything that Phil Housley expected. So it's been a lot to ask for a team changing systems, changing coaches, and all of this to make it work. Well, here's hoping. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Joe, because really, you know, at the end of the day, you can never um, anticipate anything in terms of whether or not guys are going to be healthy. And that's the number one thing in terms of having success for a team. And we saw it last year. The The best example has to be the Tampa Bay Lightning. You're seeing what's happening now because everybody is healthy, not just Steven Stamkos. Everybody is healthy over there. And so they're running amok with the NHL and they're, you know, putting a display on in terms of offense. And I'm not saying that's going to be the case once the Sabres uh, become a little bit more healthy, but there's only so much you can do when you're down so many bodies, as you mentioned. So um, here's hoping and positivity. Good luck for that team, because I know that they're capable of more. And they were one of those teams that I kind of thought that we're going to be battling for maybe the final playoff spot in the East, knowing that there were so many uh, teams in kind of like that middle kind of cluster or like, you know, the middle to end cluster and the Detroits and Carolina was is kind of in there. And the Islanders to me who are still kind of, I'm not sure who they are, but they were kind of to me in that cluster too. Didn't think New Jersey was going to be where they were. So um, I'm really hoping everyone gets healthy very soon. Uh, do you have any updates in terms of health in some of these guys and uh, maybe projections on when some of them will come back? No, the uh, the only guy who might be back soon is Justin Falk. There was, there was a question of whether or not he'd be available to play uh, this afternoon, but he was not ready to go. But they don't play till Thursday. They just sent Taylor Fadud back to Rochester. So I have a feeling we'll see Justin Falk getting involved when they when they head to Arizona and Dallas. But Zach Bogosian is a week-to-week thing. Uh, Nathan Beaulieu, we haven't heard about anything with his progress since he got banged up. And, wow. You know, that, that's, uh, it's tough. And, I mean, it's, I mean, it's just a lot of stuff where you just don't know what you can do. You just have to make do with what you got. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Joe, thank you so much for doing this. Always a pleasure chatting with you, Joe. Oh, you know it, Michelle, anytime. That's Joe Yurden from NHL.com who covers the Sabres. You can follow him on Twitter, at Joe Yurden. He uh, has made the hashtag noted jerk a very popular one and he's uh, quite funny if you like that kind of dry sarcasm uh on twitter and social media you got to follow him he's hilarious coming up after the break we talk about the washington capitals and there's a little bit of line juggling but i think the bigger story out of washington or out of edmonton so to speak because they are playing the oilers on saturday night has to be the random act of kindness that will get Isabel Kershutian to inform all of you about coming up after the break as Hockey Prime Time continues on Sirius XM NHL Network Radio, streaming live on HockeyPrimeTime.com and all of our social media pages powered by Primetime Radio.
Look at a spring Ovechkin. He gets loose and he scores! Alex Ovechkin with his 18th career hat trick. And with 9-12 to go, the great eight has tied it at four here in Ottawa. Welcome back to Hockey Primetime. Michelle Strino filling in for Connor McKenna. It's been a quick hour and a half so far, my goodness. In case you missed the first portion of the show, we got a chance to speak to John Rosen, who is the LA Kings insider. Brian Burns from Tampa Bay, Lightning.com. Christopher Martell joined us from Fox Sports Tennessee and the Neutral Zone on 104.5 The Zone. And you just heard from Joe Yearden speaking about those injury-hampered Buffalo Sabres. And, of course, uh, you can hear all past episodes of Hockey Primetime on HockeyPrimetime.com and on iTunes. But joining us on the line to talk a little bit about the man you just heard in Alexander Ovechkin and the Washington Capitals is Isabel Kershudian of the Washington Post. Isabel, thank you so much for joining us today on Hockey Primetime. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. Thanks for having me. So we are talking about Ovi, not because of his goal scoring, but the random act of kindness that he performed earlier on Saturday in Edmonton. Can you uh, divulge on the story for us, please? Yeah, it actually happened Friday where he, um, I guess he was going shopping with Dmitry Orlov and Evgeny Kuznetsov, two of his teammates. And uh, I guess saw a homeless man on the street who uh, wasn't wearing a shirt and you know, by Edmonton standards, it actually, it wasn't that cold yesterday, but it was still in, you know, the 50s, um, maybe high 40s and got colder as it got later. But um, so, I, you know, Ovechkin kind of saw him without the appropriate winter attire and um, kind of felt for him and went um, and bought him a coat, a sweater and a hat uh, and I guess a cafe. I, my understanding is the man didn't, uh, didn't recognize Ovi, but... Um, a cafe nearby did and tweeted about it. So it kind of got out in the media a little bit. Um, and Alex was actually, you know, pretty bashful talking about it today. He seemed like kind of uncomfortable even discussing it. Um, so I think he had kind of intended to do it without anyone really knowing. That makes it even better because that's what makes it a random act of kindness. Like no one has to know it, uh, which is really nice to see um, from, of course, one of the game's biggest superstars, because uh, you're seeing, like, you know, personally, I do hear about a lot of random acts of kindness, but it's because people talk about it on social media. Like, they kind of pump their own tires about it. So it's nice that <laughs> he does good things like that without wanting the recognition for it, too, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I said, he seemed, he kind of tried to, like, stop talking about it. Um, at one point, I think the first, you know, question I asked him was about that. And, um, he sort of kind of explained what happened. He's like, uh, I don't know. Next question. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I thought that was, you know, a pretty genuine reaction by him that he, he kind of had intended to do it without anyone really hearing about it. Uh, so moving on to gameplay and obviously the Vancouver game, you kind of want to a race from your memory. If you're the Washington Capitals, they head into uh, Edmonton, play Edmonton on uh, Saturday night. But now there's uh, a little bit of line juggling as well as Devontae Smith-Pelly moving up into a top six role, playing with Kuzi and Ovi and uh, Barry Trotz kind of saying like, he's one of those hardworking guys that deserves this kind of an opportunity, even though, you know, really throughout his career, he's kind of been known and his biggest fault has been his inconsistency. Is that correct? Yeah, and, you know, smith Pelly kind of said that today as well. That's the knock on him. But if you look at this Capitals team through the first 10 games, I mean, he has been one of the most consistent guys. He hasn't done anything to really wow you at any point. Um, but he's had a couple goals kind of chiseled away from him. You know, one went off, like, Nathan Walker's leg, and another one, I think Verona kind of tipped in or got a stick on or something. Um, but, you know, so he's had a little bit of that, you know, offensive upside without scoring a goal quite yet. And then um, just his play has been pretty steady. And I think some of that is, you know, Barry Trotz sort of talking to him and being like, look, I know you've moved teams a lot. I know you've been yanked around and have been in the lineup, out of the lineup. You know, here I want you to trust your game. Um, and, you know, when you're a player like Smith-Pelly, it's easy 
not to trust your game, obviously. Uh, TZ have kind of doubt. He's coming off the season where he was bought out in New Jersey. Um, so that steadiness and sort of, you know, how he's kind of stuck to the Capitals game plan, if you will, in most of these games. Um, I mean, even in that Vancouver game, I didn't think he was the problem there. Um, I, that's what's kind of going to get him a top control. And the other thing is obviously that the Caps have injuries and they're having to get kind of creative with their line combos to maybe try and have some balance through the lineup. You know, you've got uh, Jacob Verana playing with Backstrom and Oshi, but before it was Tom Wilson there. Um, and now you've got, you know, Alex Chase on in the fourth line where he was playing with Ovechkin and Kuznets up the last game. He's trying to find like, the right combination because there are, it is pretty thin right now between injuries and also just them coming into the season without, you know, someone like Marcus Johansson or Justin Williams. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you are getting Backstrom back in the lineup after he missed uh, Thursday's game with an illness. I, I kind of want to talk about even DSP moving into that role with uh, Kuzi and Ovi. And I think it's a good combination because you obviously have, you know, the two dynamic guys in Kuznetsov and Ovechkin, but it's I I don't want to compare it to the Toronto Maple Leafs and having, you know, Zach Hyman on that top top line with Matthews and Nylander, but it's the same kind of thing. Someone who is just going to be, you know, hard on the puck, good puck retrieval, and that's what's going to make you kind of successful and being uh, that kind of guy getting those two uber skilled guys the puck is really what makes that line in Toronto successful and I think what could really uh, make this line successful for the Capitals at least uh, on Saturday night against the Oilers yeah and Chuck has sort of said that like Ovechkin and Kuznetsov those two can play well together they're good they have a good two-man game as he put it Um, so the third person that's where it's tricky to figure out who that's going to be and the advantage of Smith Pally is that he has played with some higher skilled players in past stops. I think he had, you know, stretches with like gets off and Perry. Players. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and so, you know, the way like Smith Pally put it was, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to be in awe of them. Like I've done this before at every level and I've done this in the NHL. Um, and sometimes that's the other part of it is that you don't want a player who's, you know, maybe Kuznetsov gives them the puck and they're like, oh my God, I have to get it to Ovi. You know, I'm not supposed to be shooting on this line. <laughs> um, I mean, I think what they want is if someone has the shot there, then take it, you know, do your thing on that line. Um, so obviously I think his goal is to kind of make sure he gets pucks to those two. But um, I think Smith-Pelly also kind of quietly has the confidence to just do his thing there. Um, and that's sort of what got him into that spot to begin with. You know, we talk about uh, defense and all always, you know, the defenseman having to kind of chime in offensively as well. And so far, uh, there's only a couple goals off to, from defensemen and they're from Christian Juice of all players. You know, how does, yeah, right? You know, it's your rookie that you weren't even expecting uh, to be in this many games and he's got two of them and he had one of them in his first NHL game. So, uh, what's Trotz doing in order to kind of like engage uh, the defensemen and get them more involved in terms of the offensive output? Because, you know, last year you were getting a lot more from guys like Matt Niskanen and uh, even John Carlson too, really, who a couple of years ago led the postseason in scoring. So you, you've you got six assists from Car- Carlson, but you do need more from your back end and especially those two guys who are your leaders back there offensively. Yeah, I mean, the difficult thing is, um, I think it's honestly, like, unfortunately, sort of low on the priority list. Uh, <laughs> because, <laughs> because, you know, the issue they're running into is they have barely played with the lead, like, this season. I mean, they've had a couple of games where they've led the whole time. But I think if you look at their past, like, five games, um, they've barely had it. And even looking to, like, the past eight games, like, they've barely played with the lead. Um, so when you're chasing, um, you know, it's just those guys like Carlson, Orpik, um, you know, even some of the younger D, they're just playing a lot of minutes. Orlov is playing a ton of minutes. Carlson, I mean, this is his career high, and it's by, like, three minutes, I think. 
And so they're just tired, I think, of the issue. And, you know, they're having a lot of issues clearing out the puck and um, playing in the offensive zone. And, you know, those minutes are really exhausting when you're kind of in your own zone and having to defend. And so then by the time, you know, gets to, you know, trying to move the puck up ice, I mean, the demon especially are exhausted and they don't have the gas to kind of be up in the play. Yeah. Um, and that's, I mean, Carlson should start getting something on the power play um, since he plays on that top unit. And I think that's probably where a lot of his assists are coming from. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, you guys like Juice and Bowie, they're the ones who are getting the favorable matchups right now because they're the young ones and um, they're also not playing quite as heavy a load. Um, like there was a back-to-back last weekend where I think Carlson played 27-03 against uh, Detroit, and then the next night played 29-48 against wow. Florida. Um, and that's a problem. Like, <laughs> it's not a surprise that guy, like, you know, maybe isn't going up in the play quite as much as, you know, he used to because uh, he's got to be on the ice for half the game. And the other thing is they're just taking a lot of penalties, and, you know, that's adding to the fatigue factor as well where those are hard minutes. And, um Again, it's the veterans who are kind of the first over the boards there. Um, so in a way, it's surprising that Juice has the two goals, but it's also not just because he's, you know, like I said, getting the favorable matchups and he's not playing quite as much as those other guys. Yeah, with Isabel Kershutian, uh from the Washington Post who covers the Washington Capitals. You can follow her on Twitter at iKershutian. Uh, final question before we let you go. You know, you talk about the tough minutes, especially being – uh, on the PK, they're 29th uh, in the league, you know, down a man. Like you said, there's kind of like a laundry list of things to work on. I guess this would be one of those top priorities too, is making sure the puck kind of stays out of the net. That way they're not uh, working from behind all the time. And this is kind of a, a sore spot for the team too. Yeah, I would put the PK pretty high on that list of priorities. Um just because I think now it's seven of the past eight, they've allowed at least one power play goal and they've had like a couple multi power play goal games in there. Um, last game against Vancouver, they allowed three. Um, I mean, so that's the game. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, some of the problem is obviously they're taking too many penalties in some of these games. That wasn't really the issue in Vancouver. I mean, they'd allowed two through their first three penalties. You should be able to take three penalties and not allow it to power play goal. Um, so that's definitely a problem. It's in part because they have some new people there. I mean, no Carl Alsner kind of hurts the penalty kill. He did play a big role there, uh, block a lot of shots, all of that. Um, Daniel Winnick, they've had to replace him, and they're trying guys like Chase on and Smith Pelly um, in those spots. Uh, and they've just I think that's been kind of the issue for him. Um, just figuring it out with the new guys. And also they, the same way they have issues clearing the net uh, or rather clearing their zone kind of at even strength play, they're having failed clears on the penalty kill. And when you have the same four guys out there and can't change, I mean, it's just bound to end up in a goal again. So fortunately for them, uh, Edmonton's power play has kind of been struggling this year and, their penalty kills same. Um, so maybe this is a good game to kind of figure both those things out. Yeah, I was going to say, this is kind of uh, an, an interesting one because uh, they're kind of similar in terms of sometimes uh, they can't seem to get, uh, you know, the offense going at the right times. But like you said, playing from behind and Edmonton seems to be in that same boat as well, as well as the special teams. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. We really appreciate the time. We're up against the clock now. Uh, we look forward to speaking with you in the future, Isabel. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks for having me. That's Isabel Krasudian from the Washington Post. The Caps are in Edmonton to continue that uh, Western Canadian road swing of theirs. And it doesn't get any easier because they're in Calgary on Sunday as well. So this is game one of back-to-back games for them. Coming up after the break, we'll talk a little bit about shorthanded goals. Because I got an interesting stat for you as we wrap up. Hockey Primetime on Sirius XM NHL Network Radio and streaming live on HockeyPrimetime.com and all of our social media pages powered by Primetime Radio.
This is Hockey Prime Time. Michelle Strino filling in for Connor McKenna. 12 games in the NHL, one already in the books. San Jose Sharks with a 3-2 win over the Buffalo Sabres. And we do have a little bit of breaking news as the Arizona Coyotes trade a fifth-round draft pick for Scott Wedgwood. And ironically enough, the Coyotes are in New Jersey. (laughs) So Wedgwood didn't really have to go very far to join the team. So that's good news. Uh, As you know, the Coyotes have had a terrible start to the season and goaltending has been a significant issue with Antti Ranta being injured, Louis Domingue not playing well, and then Aiden Hill was just reassigned to the Tucson Roadrunners. They're 0-9-1 looking for their first win. Uh, Tough sledding for them. We thought the Montreal Canadiens had a bad... Man, I feel bad for the Arizona Coyotes. We bring back in Laura Laura Saba. Laura, I want to talk... Hi. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about, too, one of the trends that I've noticed a lot throughout the beginning of the NHL season has to be, to me, shorthanded goals. And I feel like we're seeing a ton of them. And usually, you know, you see things like, uh, you know, short side goals happen on net minders a little bit more at the beginning of the season versus in the middle and end of the season because they're getting used to positioning and all that kind of stuff. But for me, I feel like shorthanded goals are kind of through the roof this year. Now, just over three weeks into this NHL season, we have 39 shorthanded goals scored already. Now, all of 2016, there was 184. So we're already at 21% of that number. And we're about a tenth of the way, or excuse me, an eighth of the way through the season. So we're looking to surpass that number if the trend doesn't curtail at some point, which I think it will. Um, what have you kind of seen? What do you, I, I like this whole fact that we're seeing a lot of shorthanded goals. Clearly power plays are hating it and coaches <laughs> hate every second of it. But I really feel that it's adding to the entertainment value of the NHL as well. Absolutely. I actually had no idea about that stat. And it's really fascinating. And it's actually really cool if you're watching it as a fan, even as media when you're watching it. Um, shorthanded goals are always amusing in some way. Like there's always some poor guy that ends up, you know, having the de- <laughs> defensive breakdown and everybody's feeling sorry for him. And then the goaltender and, it, and, and then it's always like the guy with the breakaway taking off. And, you know, even if it's the team... Even if you're covering the team or you're cheering for the team, you kind of sometimes root for that guy just to make it because shorthanded goals are so ridiculous. Um, And I do think that I agree with you in that, like, you know, in November and December, the the play starts to slow down a lot. Part of it is teams get used to each other, teams figure each other out, and and, uh, teammates figure each other out. But at the beginning of the season, there's always a lot of scoring and there's always a lot of stuff like that, you know, like a lot of short, like an increase in shorthanded goals. So it is something that I I love. Even when it's against the Habs, I find it really funny. (laughs) Uh, Before we wrap up the show, it was awesome to step in for Connor for the two hours. So thank you again uh, for inviting me and putting together such a great show. Um, 12 games, as we mentioned, or 11 starting from 7 o'clock onwards. We talked a little bit about the New York-Montreal game, which has intrigue through the roof. Is there another game for you before we wrap up that you are definitely going to have your eyes on? Well, I mean, as as a Canadians fan, as a person in Montreal, that's definitely the one I'm keeping the eye uh, my eye on the most. Um, but I am also interested in Philly, Toronto, um, just because Philadelphia is off to a start that's much better than I expected. Um, and Toronto, even though I did expect them to have a really good start and a really good season, um, are just surpassing that. So they're two young teams. They're two fast teams. They're two teams with like certain players that you really want to watch. Um, so I'm definitely like, if, if I'm choosing, that's the team that I'm choosing to watch um, or like for the early game tonight. Interesting. Good, uh, good uh, note there. And JVR not in the lineup for uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs. I believe this is the first time he's missing a game since the 2014-2015 season. He has been uh, quite resilient in terms of health. I'm looking forward to Columbus and St. Louis, two teams that One minute. have been putting up a lot of goals and have, to me, 
the St. Louis Blues have surpassed my expectations so far at the beginning of the season. And I'm also looking forward to uh, the Minnesota-Pittsburgh game because Matt Cullen, you know, you got to love uh, the token old guy on every single <laughs> team, and he's that guy for me. There's so, like an emotional aspect to that one, yeah. Oh, absolutely, 100%. So um, I want to say thank you to all of our guests, Isabel Kershudian, Joe Yurden, Christopher Martel, Brian Burns, and John Rosen, who joined us throughout the two hours here. Of course, special thanks to Laura Saba, who put together a phenomenal show. Um, once again, through social media, you can talk, contact us at hockey, facebook.com slash hockey prime time. And if you want to listen to past episodes, they can be found on hockeyprimetime.com and iTunes. You can follow me on Twitter at Sirius X. Oh, sorry. At Michelle Storino. If you want to follow the station at Sirius X and NHL, you could tell what I'm used to, right? Um, thank into hockey primetime folks uh we're streaming always live on hockeyprimetime.com thanks so much for listening we'll see you next time